Good afternoon and welcome to uh, another in this series of seminars uh, in the Adelaide Biomed City uh, uh, series. Uh, very excited this afternoon to be able to uh, introduce two uh, uh, emerging uh, talents from uh, Central Adelaide. Uh, uh, Josh um, is a, a training in surgery and doing a PhD and Stephen uh, is an advanced trainee in neurology. Both are interested in uh, machine learning uh, and in um, uh, artificial intelligence and improving uh, the translation of research uh, into and evidence into practice. Uh, and they're both doing this in very innovative ways. So we really look forward to their joint presentation. Apologies from James Malika, who unfortunately has had a, uh, a to, to attend a funeral. So he passes on his apologies and we look forward to hearing from James. He's doing great work in medical informatics and analytics and we look forward to hearing from him, him at a, a later date. So I'll pass, pass up over to uh, Stephen and Joshua uh, and let them take it from here. Uh, please put any questions in the chat. Thank you very much, Prof. Cowan. So thank you for the opportunity to speak about the Health and Information Group, which is an initiative really to facilitate research across all levels, really focusing on practice changing research and really it all started with a journal club and the journal club is at the heart of this initiative something that we're really proud of and something we really hope is going to continue to grow so josh will talk about the journal club so the journal club initiative that has since grown into what's now known as health and information it initially started um, at the start of this year called the information and surgery journal club um, primarily at the time, a lot of our research had been in the surgical domain, um, but we've now since branched out, as Stephen will talk to a bit later, into all areas of research. We hold the sessions every fortnight or so in uh, primarily the Adelaide Health and Medical Sciences building um, on North Terrace, uh, but we've since held sessions around the state, um, most recently in Flinders and uh, most recently in other locations as well. Um, one thing that we really are proud of is that it's fostered collaboration at all levels of seniority. That includes at the most junior student levels as well. Uh, so we've had people like Professor Sanders in cardiology um, who've attended and given his guidance. Uh, we've had um, other senior, sorry, uh, we've had people like Professor Hewitt and um, Dr. Jurasevich who've come and given talks uh, we've had people like Dr. Malika as well talk about his experience. Uh, we've had Professor Liu and Professor Madden. Uh, we've had also Professor O'Callaghan uh, give his vision on clinical flow within Carlin. Uh, we've had um, Prof. Laboris talk about his MER experience. Um, and we've had uh, professors in ophthalmology, uh, professors in hepatobiliary surgery. And also, in addition to that, uh, people at the registrar level as well. Going on from there, as I talked to later, um, this guidance and this top-down model has promoted education and empowerment to start research at more junior levels also. So in addition to the registrars, we've had people at the RMO level, at the intern level, and what we're most proud of at the medical student also. One of the main ways that we fostered collaboration within the Journal Club has been through social media and through the digital medium, uh, sort of in a similar fashion to the way that Adelaide Biomed City uh, functions. Uh, a lot of the time before our sessions, we'll post a digital poster, as you can see on the screen, where we acknowledge the people we're presenting and give the location and time of the event that will happen. Uh, in terms of remote attendance, people who can't physically attend in person um, are provided with a Zoom link, um, especially those who are rural and also interstate as well. So it's the diversity in the Journal Club that's really provided with the capabilities and the activities that we'll talk about now. So in the brief of this talk, we asked to talk about the capabilities and activities of the group. As you see, the diverse interests really represent the versatility of the group. So in terms of capabilities, Really, we do all types of research that we find interesting and think has the potential to improve patient care. So this includes secondary research from perspectives and narrative reviews through to systematic reviews and all of their derivatives, including scoping reviews, umbrella reviews, and meta-analyses, as well as all types of primary research, 
including both observational studies, as well as the use of artificial intelligence, like natural language processing, imaging analysis, and deep learning, as well as interventional studies. And this includes both clinical interventional studies, including some using artificial intelligence that we'll talk to shortly, but also medical education, which we're both incredibly passionate about because we really think that it's through learning about these types of activities that we can develop more knowledge and really improve patient care. Now, we are clinicians, we are clinical trainees, and therefore the majority of our research is clinical, but we're very interested and active in epidemiological research and keen to develop our work in the basic sciences as well. And really, this is across any specialty. We have students and speakers from every specialty, and we're keen to facilitate research in all areas. That takes us to our research activities, which reflect this, which is really a broad range of topics. So briefly to try and list some examples in each of these. So in cardiology and cardiothoracic surgery, we've been looking at the optimization of outcomes following coronary revascularization, both looking at PCI and coronary artery bypass. In respiratory medicine, we're looking at respiratory failure in different patient groups, including neuromuscular respiratory failure, as may occur in, say, myasthenia gravis or Guillain-Barre syndrome. In gastroenterology and general surgery, there's a lot of work, including the Adelaide score, which we'll talk to shortly. We're also looking at the return of bowel function following general surgery operations. In terms of the urology and renal system, looking at how outcomes differ in patients with chronic kidney disease. So, for example, how acute stroke management varies in people who have a history of chronic kidney disease or dialysis. In endocrinology, in breast and endocrine surgery, we're looking at aspects of inpatient blood glucose management. In rheumatology and immunology, we're doing a lot of work around drug allergies in terms of the delabeling of allergies that are not, in fact, allergies, but intolerances or no reaction at all and facilitating future access to antibiotics. For hematology, we're looking at perioperative anticoagulation and the rational ordering of inpatient hematology investigations to reduce duplication and improve healthcare efficiency. In oncology, we're looking at adverse effects of immune checkpoint inhibitors. And in ophthalmology is a variety of projects, including researching aspects of research. So for example, using artificial intelligence to predict the number of citations that a given article will receive or the type of journal that may accept it, but also using artificial intelligence to say triage outpatient referrals and gain insights into the systemic health of a person by looking at their retina, which is looking at the blood vessels really. In dermatology, we're looking at the adverse effects of medications and how this can manifest through the dermatology um, organ system, which is one of the largest organ systems in the body. So looking at both melanoma and non-melanoma skin cancers. Now, don't get me started on neurology. We, we haven't got time for that. Um, but we clearly do a lot of work in stroke. But again, looking at neuro, neuroimmunological conditions like MS, Guillain-Barre syndrome, myasthenia gravis, looking at other aspects of cognition, looking at other aspects of disorders of consciousness, looking at aspects of epilepsy management as well. And in neurosurgery, we've done work around aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhages and outcome prediction, as well as other aspects of inpatient management around discharge planning. In psychiatry, we've been looking at both the psychiatric health of patients and doctors. So in particular, looking at burnout in trainees and mental health adverse outcomes following operations. In obstetrics and gynecology, we've been working in the area of pelvic pain and the perioperative management of pelvic pain. For general practice, this includes both metropolitan and rural general practice. We've been looking at aspects of telehealth and how to optimize aspects of telehealth, which clearly has become such a large part of practice in COVID. We do work on COVID as well. Now, in emergency medicine, we're looking at aspects of patient flow, predicting outcomes in emergency department visits to try and help that patient flow. For anesthesiology and pain medicine, it's a lot of the factors that influence perioperative pain and opioid prescribing in that setting. Palliative care, we've been looking at the management of palliative symptoms, both end-of-life and non-end-of-life palliative care in extreme situations, including ones in remote and rural locations. From a public health perspective, we've been looking at how aspects of the social determinants of health influence inpatient stays and readmissions, in particular trying to identify potentially modifiable risk factors for readmission and identifying people who may benefit from additional interventions to prevent readmission. Perioperative medicine is a large area that we're working in, 
again, you know, looking at aspects of pain management, anticoagulants, as well as perioperative medicine in rural and remote locations, including space, which we'll talk to shortly. Uh, for radiology, it's really looking at individual radiological signs and trying to improve the evidence base to individual diagnostic uh, images that we may see. So, you know, for example, one that I've always found interesting is the swallow, swallow tail sign or the hummingbird sign. You know, these signs really conjure images and uh, bring the imagination to life, but can we improve the evidence base through which we use these radiological signs to improve diagnoses? Do a lot of work in general medicine, say looking at length of stay, discharge planning, readmissions, predicting deterioration, as well as looking at individual parameters for general medicine patients, like inpatient hypertension and how that's managed. And this is just to cap off some of the diverse interests is space medicine. So space medicine is an increasingly recognized field and it's a very important field. And we're starting work in this area, looking at aspects of, say, perioperative medicine in space, although ideally you avoid operations in space where possible. So to provide a few concrete individual examples, the Adelaide score is one piece of work that we're particularly proud of. This has been led by Josh, and we've been lucky to collaborate with a variety of senior experts from diverse fields to develop this score which is an artificial intelligence measure looking at individual patient parameters to predict their timing of discharge and readiness for discharge, in particular looking at trends in vital signs of the preceding 48 hours. This is currently in submission. Once it's gone through that process, we'll be looking at validating it externally and working towards implementation studies, because that's where all of our research is heading. We want to change practice to improve our patients' outcomes. This is where every piece of artificial intelligence research that we do is headed, which is trying to influence practice. We've been very fortunate to be supported in this regard by one of the Carl and Cripps grants, which is recently granted for one of our projects looking at penicillin allergies. So penicillin allergies are common, up to one in 10 people may have one, and many of these have been labeled erroneously, or people may have grown out of their allergy for want of a better term, and this deprives them of access to first-line antibiotics like penicillins, moxicillin, tazacin. These are potentially life-saving antibiotics that are first-line treatment for serious conditions like sepsis or hospital-acquired pneumonias. And through the use of deep learning and a follow-up penicillin allergy delabeling pathway, we'll be working to bring this practice-changing information to Carlin patients. And we're doing this currently, but we're very grateful for the, for the support that we've received. So that's a brief overview of some of our activities. Um, currently, there are over 80 active projects, and that wasn't all of the areas we're working in, but all the ones we could fit on a slide. And we have an equal number of contributors, and these contributors really range from every level of seniority and background. We've been lucky to work with first-year university students, both medical students and non-medical students, right through to final-year students who are weeks away from starting internship, interns, residence registrars, and senior consultants who really bring an extra level of expertise to these projects and can really help foster the starting research careers of these junior researchers as early as the first days of medical school. And I think that's really what our strength is. Um, it's the fact that through the Journal Club model, we've actually formed a network. And it's a network that fosters not only um, ongoing collaboration, but also innovation on a much larger scale than that would be possible from any individual or any small um, individual niche group. Um, what we're really benefiting from being in Central Adelaide primarily and um, linking with organizations such as the Adelaide Biomed City is that we've all been supported in these sort of ventures. Um, one of the things that we're very proud of, especially in most recent months, is that we've used the online and um, in-person community that we built through the Journal Club model to then extend out, out of South, across and out of South Australia. So firstly, we've, also, we've done work now that's formally across both Adelaide and Flinders Medical School. And we're grateful that both parties in that respect have been supportive of one another and working with people in other institutions. We've now conducting projects that span across all health networks. So people in within Central Adelaide, within Southern Adelaide, and also now Northern Adelaide. 
have been extremely supportive and um, open to working together. And I think that really um, makes a lot of the work that we do stronger and also more efficient. Using this really strong foundation within South Australia, that's now statewide, we've recently branched out to things um, internationally. So we've now formed connections with groups in the US, in New Zealand, in UK, in Canada, and uh, actively looking into forming collaborations and links with other places around the world. Um, one of the main ways that we've done this sort of following on from the community that we built through the Journal Club model has been through the digital media. And that is we've created a website called Research Proceed, which essentially acts as a matchmaking function linking potential collaborators. Um, I encourage you all to sign up for this um, because it's free and it's been endorsed by um, the University of Adelaide and other prominent institutions within South Australia. And we hope that this will really foster um, collaboration both within South Australia and more broadly going forward. So uh, the link for this is on the screen and we highly encourage you uh, to look into this further. Just to give you some examples, um, this is one study where we've used this collaborative model to branch out not only to New Zealand, but also to New York in the US, um, to with the University of Cambridge in the UK, and also interstate uh, in the University of Melbourne. Most recently, we've also been linking with um, colleges. So the Royal Australasian College of Surgeons has been extremely supportive of um, collaborative research. And we've been lucky to publish some work that's focused at the national level, looking at quality improvement. One of the things that we're extremely proud and are now announcing sort of for the first time in a formal setting is an ongoing collaboration with Heart of the Nation. Now, uh, for those of you who don't know, um, Greg Page, uh, the original Yellow Wiggle, um, in the past few years uh, was unfortunate to suffer a cardiac arrest during one of his shows. And that prompted him uh, to go on and take on the challenge of trying to reduce sudden cardiac death at a, not only a national, but hopefully in the future, an international level. Uh, one of the things we're very proud of is that um, we've fostered a really concrete collaboration with Greg and with Heart of the Nation and are able to hopefully support a lot of the brilliant work that he does. I think one of the benefits that we provide through this collaboration is providing some of the scientific drive behind a lot of the brilliant work within the Australian communities that Heart of the Nation already does. So already through this, um, we've done a national survey that looks at signage uh, for both the signs and cabinets that are used to mark the placement of automated external defibrillators across Australian society. That's currently in submission. Uh, we've done some work looking into the laws that go around AEDs. Uh, we've published um, we've published one that's shown on the screen looking at the societal change uh, that's necessary to reduce sudden cardiac death systemically. And also uh, looking at the shock, not only in a biomedical sense, but also in a psychosocial sense that accompanies uh, sudden cardiac death and the effect that it has on the bereaved. That's just been accepted and uh, will soon be published. Uh, but we're looking to really explore this collaboration with Heart of the Nation and look to also foster um, work across state lines as well going forward. So, well, uh, to conclude, um, we're very grateful for the opportunity to present today. And um, I think it's only possible to do all this work because we're in South Australia, and especially given that we're both at a very junior level, um, we couldn't have done it without all of the support um, across all levels uh, within the healthcare infrastructure. Um, we're always open for more collaboration, and it's our philosophy that through collaboration and through working together, um, the work that we're able to do is a lot stronger, a lot more efficient, and also a lot more beneficial for patients both within Adelaide and also more broadly. Um, for those of you who are free, we highly encourage you to attend our next journal club session. Uh, that will be on Monday, the 21st of November at the Adelaide Health and Medical Sciences building. Um, somebody, uh, we, one of the medical students is presenting, but to compliment him, 
Um, Dr. Nyman, the orthopedic surgeon, will be talking about his national podcast that he's developed. Uh, so we highly encourage you and invite anybody who wishes to come uh, to come and attend and to use that to also do some work going forward in the future. Uh, so to wrap up, um, we're open to any questions, both in this forum and also um, our emails are on the screen. We're happy to be contacted anytime and we're really grateful for the opportunity to, to talk. Thank you. Well, thank you both very much. Um, uh, Josh, I think you, you should organize an urgent consult for uh, for Jeff from the Wiggles with Stephen there. See, so can you do anything about his constant somnolence? Uh, and I'm not sure I can't see the um, the little uh, the box there with the chat with the questions, but um, uh, we, we would encourage people to um, uh, to pop some questions in. Just just while we're waiting, do you want to speak a little bit to the methodologies you are employing? Uh, to tease out some of these uh, questions which are quite similar across different disciplines. Um, uh, so in terms of what what do you mean? Um, in... So many of the, the questions that you're, you're interested in are about the application of particular therapies, either at scale or more effectively uh, within patient cohorts. So um, uh, you're using a lot of um, your knowledge around how to extract information from the medical record and to use that information in various different ways to address these questions. So um, given the breadth of different disciplines or, you know, areas of medicine and surgery or interrogating, what is the commonality of approach that you're using to do that? So I think it's rather than a single approach, it's a suite of approaches ultimately. And I think there's a single approach that really covers it. So one of the ways that we start, and this is obvious, often one of the ways that medical students can get started is by examining what's been done. Um, so doing a systematic evaluation of the literature with the established methodology around, say, the PRISMA P guidelines, and really taking a robust look at what evidence is there to support what we're doing currently is often the place we start. So, for example, uh, predicting respiratory failure in neuromuscular conditions is one where it's something I encounter very often. I think it's something ICU doctors probably encounter fairly often. But when you really drill down on the practice that's being employed in multiple places, the evidence behind it is often really lacking. And then when there's that lack of evidence, that's what prompts us to pursue specific avenues. So when there's just a lack of observational data, and for example, what is the trend in forced vital capacity prior to requiring intubation in my senior gravis? Is that data actually available? When it's not, starting off with descriptive studies is often a place that we go first because it, it provides information that you can then use to guide future interventions. And you know, moving towards future interventional studies is going to be on a case-by-case -case basis. I think that you know, that's kind of our overarching approach that we're taking to each question, as it were, um, trying to employ an evidence-based approach in each of the questions and fields that we encounter. Yeah, I think a lot of our approaches, they're multifaceted. Uh, so we're trying to really characterize every aspect of every problem that we're looking at. Um, and we're doing that through a variety of designs. So systematic reviews, characterizing the literature around the topic, um, retrospective analyses, looking at um, stored patient data and how it uh, how what associations we can find um, from the retrospective data. Um, going forward in the future, we want to look at things in both a quantitative and qualitative way. So we've already thought of ideas for, say, for example, surveys and interview studies to also complement prospective research um, next year in 2023. So I think, as Stephen said, um, a lot of our approaches, we look to drill down on a lot of key problems, but our approaches will be broad. So I'm just going to just check to see are there any questions. If there aren't, I'll keep going. So to summarize, you, your, your position is that you really are, are approaching problems from first principles, asking first what is known and then what information is available and then subsequently what methodologies can be applied to, uh, to analyze the available information and then obviously the methodology that you would choose 
would depend on the nature of the information that's available, whether it's qualitative, or quantitative, or, you know, machine learning. So in terms of, you know, so you've got heterogeneity of, of, of information in terms of analyzing that, uh, what do you believe to be, you know, the innovations that you're, you're, you're bringing to your work? So we can bring innovation in terms of the types of data that are being analyzed, as well as how the data is being analyzed and I guess why it's being analyzed as well. So in terms of the types of data that are being analyzed, I think that South Australia is really set up to lead the way in many fields in terms of the types of data that we have in our electronic medical record and the types of services that we provide to our patients throughout the state. So for example, the stroke unit is a center of excellence at the Royal Adelaide Hospital. They're providing world leading therapies and really by collecting data on these therapies, we can provide novel insights. In terms of analytical approaches, you know, for example, routinely collected data around say, demographics, comorbidities, ICD-10 codes, um, those have been used previously to try and predict readmission. Um, you know, for example, you know, predicting deterioration, there's various scores that can be used for that, you know, either in an ICU setting or in any other setting. But in addition to using conventional approaches like multivariable logistic regression, which is still very effective at times, that's where we can employ some novel analytical approaches when it's appropriate to the question that's being asked. So um, machine learning, I guess, is a talk in, in and of itself, but when the question is suitable and when the data is suitable, are suitable, then we can use approaches, for example, like artificial neural networks and their derivatives like convolutional neural networks, which are typically used for imaging analysis, but can be employed on text, and recurrent neural networks, which are typically more used for text analysis. Uh, those methods can be employed, but even with your discrete data fields like your ICD-10 codes, you can employ, for example, XGBoost algorithms and see does using the exact same data fields is a better performance achieved using a different analytical approach. But I guess thirdly is using the data that is available to answer questions, answer new questions. And I think that's one thing that we really pride ourselves on is, you know, we are clinicians, we see patients every day. And I think that's one thing that we really can bring is keeping this patient centered. It's very easy and sometimes alluring to predict or analyze outcomes that are available, that are just, you know, it, it's, a, it's a question that's begging to be asked, but does it actually matter? And I think that we are finding new ways to take data that is available and able to be collected and use it to try and answer questions that are going to influence our patients and their experiences moving forwards and really keeping it centered on the patient and the healthcare system. So give us an example um, of a question that would be suitable for machine learning as an as a avenue of further interrogation. So one that's suitable for machine learning is, for example, identifying a infrequent but adverse outcome in a large heterogeneous data set. So for example, we're looking at some work around identifying hospital-acquired complications. So, you know, deep vein thromboses, hospital-acquired infections, post-surgical hospital-acquired infections. Now, observing some of these things and identifying them takes a lot of person power. It takes a lot of time and a lot of resources. Now, machine learning, once you've developed the algorithms, depending on the type of algorithm that you've developed, can actually be employed with relatively little computational power. And it means that you can use it to really identify, for example, post-surgical infections and then bring them to the attention of the staff who would normally be looking for them or even risk stratify them so that they can be identified more readily. And that means that the staff who are then working around it, or this is, you know, you've got to make the models first and show that they work. Machine learning doesn't work for everything. Um, then means in subsequent studies, you could actually try and use it to, you know, People always worry about humans being replaced by computers, but really to facilitate what the humans are already doing. So say, for example, if you're able to risk stratify every single patient who's had an operation, say this person we think probably has a post-operative infection or think this person is very unlikely, you can then direct people around that to 
try and optimize the time that they're already putting in. They put in the same amount of time, but they're just able to use it more effectively to try and work with the computer rather than be replaced by a computer or have a computer entirely take over a job. So in terms of really addressing your questions, that, that's one example and it's suitable because it's large data sets, heterogeneous data sets, clinically applicable, and there's a pathway to implementation. Thank you very much. And I think that brings us to the end of our time. I certainly don't see a computer replacing the two of you anytime mm -hmm. soon. So keep up the good work and thanks so much for presenting today. Thank you very much, Professor Cowan.